viruses. So remember with a naked virus, with a naked viral particle or virion, it's just the nucleic acid surrounded by the protein. There is no envelope. And that has some physiological consequences. One, it makes them pretty environmentally stable. Because they don't have an envelope, right, they're less, less sensitive to changes in temperature, they're less sensitive to acid, they're less sensitive to drying out. It's harder to get rid of them, basically. Um, the other consequence of that for our bodies is that they are always released from a cell through lysis. So they will cause host cell death because what happens during viral replication is that, at least with naked viruses, they will replicate, 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 replicate until they completely fill up the host cell and cause the host cell to burst. Um, so that's consequences. They're spread easily on fomites, so like on surfaces, hand-to-hand, um, -hand, dust, small droplets. They can dry out and still be infective. They can survive the gut. So a lot of our gastrointestinal viruses are naked, uh, resistant to detergents and poor sewage treatment. Uh, however, antibody is usually sufficient for protection because the antibody can bind the proteins that are exposed as part of the capsid and prevent the virus from attaching to the host cell. Now, when we contrast naked viruses with enveloped viruses, the envelope is literally just like a, it's a phospholipid bilayer because it's derived from our own host cell membrane. Some viruses that are enveloped during the replication process inside the host cell, they actually um, have the host cell synthesize viral proteins that get embedded in the membrane. And we see that, for example, with COVID-19, how um, the mRNA vaccines help you uh, neutralize the spike protein. So it's a viral protein that gets embedded in our cell membrane so when the virus is leaving the host cell and taking part of our membrane, it has those proteins in the surface. But because they have an envelope, they are more environmentally sensitive. Right? They're easier to destroy with acids, detergents, um, drying, heat. And what happens is if the envelope is compromised, the virus can no longer cause infection. These can be released in a couple of different ways. One, they can be released through lysis, but also really commonly we see that some of these envelope viruses are released by budding. They push their way out of the host cell, and as they leave, they grab a piece of the host cell membrane and use it as the envelope. So the consequences for that are they have to stay wet. If they dry out, the envelope dries out and is compromised, you can't have an infection. We don't see them as commonly as GI pathogens because they're sensitive to acid. You usually have to have large droplets or secretions for transmission. So we're talking like, you know, when people sneeze, right? Those are large droplets. It doesn't have to kill the cell to spread because it can pop off by budding. So it can just take a little piece of the membrane at a time. I mean, eventually you take too much membrane, so it's gonna die. Or if you've taken over too much host cell machinery, the host cell will die. But with naked viruses, they have to kill the host cell to get out. Envelope viruses don't. Um, sometimes you also will need antibody and cell mediated immune responses. T cells can be very important here. Uh, and you can sometimes have hypersensitivity um, and you can get a lot of what we call immunopathogenesis. Remember that idea that the infection triggers the immune system and the immune system is causing damage, not the infection itself, especially when the viruses are not causing host cell death. But if they are triggering the immune system and the immune system is responding, you may get damage. Uh, viruses are generally pretty cool looking under an electron microscope. Um, so they have these individual, uh, like capsimere, like the individual units that make up the capsid and you can get all these really cool shapes. And then with the enveloped virions, you sometimes get viral proteins embedded in the, in the envelope. And these often serve as viral attachment proteins. They are the protein that the virus uses to bind to the host cell. 
like the spike protein of COVID-19. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the details of viral replication because we will talk about some of these when we talk about um, the specific uh, viruses themselves because every type of virus is a little bit different. But in general, you have like some major steps. You have recognition and attachment. The virus has to be able to bind to the host cell. If it cannot bind, it cannot cause infection. And that attachment is really what makes viruses specific for a specific host or for a specific cell type. Sometimes um, a virus is specific to a particular species, like smallpox virus was, it no longer exists, specific for humans, didn't infect any other animal. But rabies viruses can infect almost every mammal, but they only infect the nervous system. So they're tissue specific instead of host specific. Okay, but that specificity is because of the attachment. Uh, the virus then has to get into the host cell penetration, that's what we call it. Um, you'll have uncoating, so you have an opening up of the virus to allow the nucleic acids to come out. And then, you know, you have all these different steps in here, but basically the idea is replication or viral biosynthesis um, and then release. And again, different viruses do this in different ways. Uh, you know, so you have the option here. Some of them do an envelope. Some of them cause lysis. Um, and then what they're showing you here in pink are different types of drugs and how they can inhibit viral infection. Treating a virus is a lot more difficult than treating a bacterial infection. When we talk about antibiotics and how we treat viral infections, we're really talking about taking advantage of how bacteria are different from people. They have a cell wall. We don't. They use different protein synthesis machinery, different DNA synthesis machinery, different metabolic pathways, so we can target those things. But a virus takes over your cell. So if you stop a virus from replicating, you're kind of stopping your own cell from replicating. And that sometimes is the challenge where you have a lot of these drugs that work, that will cause toxicity to the host, but they work because the viral um, replication is faster than the cellular replication. The other thing that can be really important when you're trying to design an antiviral therapy is to think about, is there anything super, super unique about the virus that perhaps we could target? And there are some antiviral therapies that we have that do target very specific features of certain viruses. And so when we talk about viral replication, we can do like this little growth curve that you may have seen something similar when you talk about bacterial growth. Um, but really what we're looking at is it's not like a steady increase in the amount of virus that we see. We basically go from nothing to everything because it bursts out. And the amount of virus that bursts out that is infectious, we call the burst size. So a lot of the times when the host cell is trying to replicate the virus, it makes mistakes and it makes defective viral particles. The burst size represents the number of infectious viral particles released per infected cell. And that number can vary and the burst can happen soon or it can take a long time. So one of the longer you know, time to you know, max replication is something like a retrovirus. It can take hours and it has a relatively low burst size, amount of infectious particles produced. But something like P coronaviruses or even rhabdoviruses they can replicate very, very quickly, and they have very, very high burst size. So this basically means that five hours after the virus was infecting a single cell, that single cell in five hours produced 100,000 infectious particles. So theoretically, one cell can then lead to the infection of 100,000 cells. 
And each of those 100,000 could, in five hours, infect 100,000 more each, right? So you see how viral infections can sometimes, you can experience symptoms relatively quickly with some of them. You know, like, oh, grandma and grandpa are sneezing. That's great. Tomorrow I'm going to have that same cold. Yeah, you probably are. Okay, or if your kid comes home, oh, that's, that's wonderful. That's tomorrow for me. Or maybe the next day if you're lucky. Something like the flu, right, is a little bit slower, fewer particles. So, you know, you're just counting down the days because, you know, it's going to be a couple days you're going to be sick. But you get a lot of virus produced in one cell. So the recognition or attachment is the critical step. That determines uh, what host can be infected and what tissue is going to be infected. So you have limited host range. So when we say host range, that means what species can be infected. And you have tissue tropism, what cells are susceptible. So a viral infection is not going to target all of your cells. HIV targets like CD4 positive T cells and a subset of macrophages. It's pretty tissue limited. Or they'll target cells of your mucous membrane or cutaneous cells. It really depends on the virus, but it will have a range. With DNA viruses, a DNA-based genome, most DNA viruses, not all, but most, when they get into the host cell, the first thing they have to do is get the DNA from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. And they have to do that because in the host nucleus is where we have DNA polymerase to replicate the DNA and RNA polymerase to do transcription. So if they don't bring their own polymerase, and there are a couple that do, if they're going to depend on your polymerase, they have to get into the nucleus. So that's what we're showing here. The uh, viral DNA goes into the nucleus. It can be replicated in there, and it can also be transcribed. Um, once it's transcribed, it can be exported into the cytoplasm for translation. And the DNA can be replicated. The genome can be replicated. And once all of this replication starts happening, you get assembly of the viruses. They can move from cell to cell. They can burst the cell. But broadly, that's the thing about DNA viruses. They almost always have to get the nucleic acids. They have to get the DNA into the nucleus because that's where the machinery is. So that's their challenge as a DNA virus. Okay. So it's helpful, though, because DNA, remember, DNA is way more stable than RNA. So it's OK that it takes time for the DNA to get into the nucleus. What we often see with a lot of DNA viruses is they es establish what we call persistent infections. Um, they can be latent, where they may pop up later. And we see this with things like the herpes viruses, um, herpes simplex one and two, chickenpox, varicella zoster, which is another uh, human herpes virus, um, human papillomavirus can be latent. They can also be immortalizing. They can cause cancer. So human papillomaviruses cause cancer, specifically like of the mucous membranes something like 70% of oral cancers, 99.3% of cervical cancers are because of human papillomavirus. Um, herpes viruses like Epstein-Barr. Epstein-Barr can cause um, lymphoma. Okay. The viral DNA has to go into the nucleus. The exception is the pox viruses, like smallpox. They don't go, put their DNA in the nucleus. They bring their own polymerase with them. The viral DNA resembles the host DNA. That's why host machinery will take it and replicate it. It doesn't like check, ooh, is this ours or is this, you know, virus? Or, nah, whatever, it's DNA, looks good. Let's copy it, let's transcribe it, we're good to go. Uh, so the virus, viral genes have to interact with host transcriptional machinery, again, except for pox viruses. 
Um, and they do regulate their transcription temporally. What that means is early in the infection, there are certain proteins that will be made. Later in the infection, it's other proteins that will be made. So first, they make DNA binding proteins and enzymes, the things they need to quickly do replication, transcription. Then they can make the capsid and their other structural proteins. Larger DNA viruses will sometimes have their own mechanisms to improve their replication. Uh, and here's a cartoon just showing a little bit in more detail about RNA viral replication. So RNA viral replication uh, can be a little bit tricky. And it depends on whether or not you have a plus strand uh, or a minus strand RNA virus. These viruses do not have to go to the nucleus. We don't really deal with RNA in the nucleus. We make RNA in the nucleus. We transcribe it. If you're already RNA, you don't have to go to the nucleus. So the majority of RNA viruses stay in the cytoplasm. Those that are plus sense strands, they look a lot like mRNA. They basically can be translated right away and start making proteins. They usually will also encode a gene that encodes for a protein to copy that RNA. With uh, negative sense strand RNA viruses, they have to bring in their own polymerase. Our body doesn't know what to do. Our cells don't know what to do with a negative sense strand RNA. We don't know how to translate it. And we don't know how to replicate it. So if the virus doesn't bring its own machine, like its own um, polymerase to transcribe the negative to a positive strand, there's no infection. So they have to bring it along with them. Um, virus, RNA viruses are more unstable and they are more prone to mutation. So again, the classic example that we can talk about because we've been living through it for the past almost four years now is SARS coronavirus 2, the virus that causes COVID-19 is an RNA-based virus. And I think we all know it's like, oh, wait, which one is it now? Is it Delta? Is it Omicron? Right? Because it mutates all the time. So RNA-based viruses are more prone to mutation. And when we talk about the specific RNA viruses, we'll talk a little bit more about the details of how they replicate, um, especially if it's important for you to understand about that virus. So right now we're just talking in kind of broad terms about viral replication. The genetics of viruses can be interesting. Um, really the one that I want you to look at is here number two. Uh, the genetics of the flu virus are pretty interesting. Most viruses have a single piece of genetic material. It's like a chromosome, right? They have one. It's not a chromosome, but it's like a chromosome. Flu viruses have eight different pieces of RNA. They're RNA-based viruses. Um, each of those pieces encodes for different genes. So it's like that virus has eight chromosomes. So what can happen is if an animal is infected with two different flu viruses, so let's say one is the number flu and one is the letter flu, it could be a swine flu, avian flu, whatever, but number and letter flu. In that host that has the two different flu viruses, the numbers and letters can get mixed up. And so now you have two brand new flus that came out that are alpha they're now alphanumeric, but they're different from one another. So that's why you get different flu strains every year. How are they gonna mix and match this time? And so scientists do the best they can to predict which versions are gonna start circulating in people so they can make a vaccine every year. So it's part of the reason why we have to do things like get a flu shot every year, a flu booster, because you don't know which version is gonna come around. So that's the most interesting one. 
the usually when they advertise like the flu vaccine and stuff, they always just say A and B. Well, so A and B is like a broad classification of flu virus, but within each like influenza A and influenza B, like a there's B1, all these different B3. types. Mm -hmm. H1N1, okay. H2N3, and that's like different too. So yeah, you get all the mix and match. Yeah. That's a good question though. But yeah, um, A and B are usually the ones that infect people. Um, but like we took the kids for their two-year-old visit not that long ago and they got their flu shot and the pediatrician was like you want to do the flu shot today or next time I'm like no today please thank you mm -hmm. and she was like oh yeah I had a six-month-old infant in that was positive for both A and B so we had two different flus at the same time so yeah I'm like yes please please vaccinate my children um, but overall when you're talking about a viral disease um, and its severity just like with bacterial infections you're talking about um, you know, what virus is it? And what does the virus do inside the body? Um, what is the host status? Are they naive? Have they never seen it before? Are they immunized? Have they had the infection before? Right, all of those things you have to think about. How competent is that person's immune system? Just like with a bacterial infection. Um, how many viral particles were they exposed to? overall health of the person, their nutrition, their genetics, their age. So all of the things that affect bacterial di disease severity also can affect viral disease severity. Okay. And when we talk about what does the disease look like, like what's the classic progression, again, it's very similar to bacterial disease. You are exposed to the organism, you get the infection at the primary site, so the target tissue. If it's an enterovirus, it's your GI tract. If it's an adenovirus, it's your respiratory tract, right? The virus causes an infection in the primary location. You get innate immune responses. You have an incubation period where you don't feel sick yet, but the virus is replicating. It may enter your bloodstream and travel to other uh, sites of the body. It continues to replicate in the target tissue and eventually you will experience the symptoms. If it's an enterovirus, you may have diarrhea or vomiting. If it's a respiratory virus, you might have a runny nose right, or a cough. You have your host responses um, your antibody responses will hopefully keep viral particles from binding to new cells. Uh, your um, cell-mediated immune response will kill infected cells. Generally, the target tissue is going to allow the virus to spread. So if it's an enterovirus and your patient has diarrhea, the feces are gonna be loaded with virus. Um, if it's a respiratory virus, their mucus and their saliva will be loaded with virus. So the virus can spread. And then your patient, well, your patient may die. Hopefully not. We hope your patient will get better. Sometimes your patient may have a persistent or chronic infection. Depends on the virus, depends on the person. Everybody reacts in a different way. Okay. How do viruses get into the body? Most commonly, most viruses that humans get are respiratory viruses. So inhalation is the most common. How many colds do you get per year? Okay. Or the flu or COVID? Probably that's gonna be your most common. Uh, ingestion is also common, but let's just fingers crossed that we don't get norovirus because that's a lot of poop. Breaks in the skin, um, particularly with our arboviruses that penetrate the skin. Sexual contact, just like you get any other infection. Right? Uh, viruses, though, are not capable of burrowing in through intact skin. Spirochetes can, some bacteria can, a lot of parasites can, viruses can. So you have to have some introduction into the body. Um, when viral particles are traveling through the bloodstream, we call that viremia. Okay. 
as you might expect. And so again, there are four potential outcomes of infection, a failed infection. This is like looking at um, kind of an individual cell, right? The cell could not be infected. They call it an abortive infection. The cell could die, that's lytic. The virus can replicate without causing cell death, that's persistent. The virus is present inside of the cell, but it is not replicating, but it might later. And so we call that latent recurrent. And again, latent recurrent is really common with our herpes viruses. You just, you never know. When is it coming back? So, you know, again, these are just kind of things we've already talked about, so I won't spend too much time going over this because we've already talked about it. Um, one of the things that might help you as a clinical laboratory scientist, those of you going into CLS, is recognizing what the virus actually does to the cell. And they call that the cytopathologic effects, or CPE, cytopathologic effects. Um, and that can sometimes be visualized on a microscope. You, using a standard microscope, you can't see a virus, but you can sometimes see what the virus does to infected cells. So you could see things like inclusion bodies, um, pockets basically of where the virus is replicating. Uh, sometimes you get these giant multinucleated cells. You get syncytia, where cells have started to fuse. Um, in eukaryotic cell culture, we normally expect to see cells kind of spread out and adhere to the bottom of a plate, but different viral infections can cause them to kind of like round up and dissociate from the plate. So it's what do you see? A really, really common type of cytology that's done um, is when people get a pap smear. You are looking for changes to the cervical cell that are almost certainly caused by human papillomavirus infection. Again, 99.3% of cervical cancers are positive for human papillomavirus. So really, really high rates of infection. When you are trying to diagnose a viral infection, which we'll also talk about in just a little bit, you know, you're looking for mostly antibodies against the virus. Or you're looking for a type of antibody antigen interaction. That's the principle of how your COVID-19 tests work, right? You stick the swab up your nose, rub it around, if you have an active viral infection, hopefully your swab picks up some of the viruses and within that little um, plastic test thing they give you, there are antibodies. And as if you have the virus and it comes into contact with the antibodies, you get a color change and you can see that on the test. So it takes advantage of antibody antigen interactions. Okay. What we will see a lot with a lot of viral infections is that the symptoms of a lot of viral infections are what we call flu-like illness. You're tired, you're achy, you have a fever, you don't feel good. Do you have the flu or do you have Ebola? You'll find out if you start bleeding out of your eyeballs. They all start with flu-like illness. It's a very, very common response. And what you're looking at is interferon, that really non-specific innate response to viral infection causes those symptoms. So most viruses will cause those symptoms first before you get to the specific symptoms of each virus. And again, I won't spend too long here because as we talk about every virus, we'll talk about the different ways that they do this. Um, kind of the last, well, uh, one of the last things in, in this section is that some viruses cause cancer. And again, when we talk about the cancer causing viruses, I'll tell you how they cause cancer. 
but there are a number of different viruses that are associated with being oncogenic, cancer-causing. Again, these are the types of immune responses you might see. We'll talk more about them as we talk about the different viruses. Um, and then the disease severity, again, as we've already talked about, depends on a combination of factors. How the patient got infected, where they got infected, what the patient is like in terms of their immune status, their age, their overall health, how many viral particles were they exposed to, and the genetics of the virus and the host. Okay, so maybe, you know, mom and dad got super severe COVID because they were exposed to a different strain and they're fine now, but it was pretty severe but you got exposed to a, a way less severe strain. And so, you know, you didn't feel good for a couple days, you turned positive, so you didn't have to come to class for a week and a half, but you were okay. It all depends. So it's really hard to predict what a virus will do in any one patient. Hmm? No? And then again, the types of diseases uh, we can see, we'll talk more about these um, as we talk about the individual infections, but most people, when they get a viral infection, we call it acute. You got the virus, you didn't feel good, and now you're fine. Like you got a cold, or you got norovirus. Um, sometimes you have an acute infection, and then like decades later, could experience really significant consequences. A, the classic example here is measles, where if you have measles, um, in some patients, the virus kind of persists in the host, and eventually um, they can develop encephalitis, like decades later. Uh, latent recurrent are things like herpes simplex, um, varicella zoster, which is like chickenpox shingles, you have the initial infection. So let's do varicella zoster. You had chicken pox. Okay. Hopefully you haven't had chicken pox, but I had chicken pox. So I had chicken pox. I was fine after about a week or so. It was a little itchy, whatever. But now that virus lives in my body. And that means that at some point I may, not a guarantee, but I may develop shingles, which is the recurrent chicken pox because the virus is hanging out somewhere in my nervous system and one day it might just pop out on one of my nerves and cause shingles. Hopefully not, but it could. Okay. Chronic infection, things like hepatitis B and C are very hard to clear. Um, patients often experience years or decades of disease. Um, chronic infection, where patients experience um, an early acute episode and then a very late disease episode, HIV is the classic. When a patient is first infected with HIV, they will almost certainly experience a week or two of flu-like symptoms. And then whenever, right, years, decades, they will experience the complete like, shutdown of their immune system. So you have the early acute, which is totally different from what the late disease looks like. And then you have very slow infections where you don't experience the disease until way, way later. Um, and even though prions aren't viruses, we do cover prions in this section. So prion diseases are also kind of like this, where you'd be infected, you would never know, and then all of a sudden you start to experience symptoms and you die. So those are the kind of disease courses we can expect. But again, the majority of us, the majority of our patients will be experiencing acute infection, which is good, right? Really good. Okay. And in terms of epidemiology, we've talked about how you get a viral infection, air, food and water, surfaces, secretions, sexual contact um, from animals or insects. Um, or genetic, like retroviruses. And what promotes disease transmission? Is the virus stable? Um, did it get into the right medium for transmission? If it needs to be in droplets, is it in big droplets? 
Uh, people who are asymptomatic carriers are big factors in disease transmission. Um, and then whether or not your immune system is good enough to fight it off. Uh, risk factors are like everything. Your risk factor for infection doesn't really change, bacterial, viral, whatever. Uh, critical community size, how many people in the community are susceptible. If that number is really high, you're more likely to see a disease spread. And then, of course, geography and season. Okay. How do we control viral infection? Quarantine getting rid of a vector. That's why we have, I mean, even in Turlock, you have a mos you have mosquito abatement district because mosquitoes in this area are really prone to transmitting West Nile virus. So you get rid of mosquitoes, you don't have West Nile virus. Immunization or vaccination, um, treatment and education. Okay, questions about general virology. And again, like I know I went through that a little bit fast, but we are going to cover um, the specifics of each virus as we talk about the different viral families. Okay. So again, this one um, will just kind of introduce in general viral diagnosis and treatment, but as we talk about the viruses, we'll talk more specifically about how they are diagnosed and treated. In general, um, some of the best ways to diagnose viral infection are going to be serology, Western blots, ELISAs, right? You're looking at antigen, antibody interactions, um, or nucleic acid tests. Um, for COVID-19, a lot of times places were only accepting like the positive test, not the at-home test, but you had to go get the, the PCR. Right? They had to actually detect the viral RNA. So you can do that as well. Less commonly, you can try to isolate and grow the virus. It's challenging because you have to be proficient in eukaryotic cell culture. And it has to be in the cell culture, the tissue type that the virus infects. Okay. If it's a virus that infects the nervous system and you're using kidney cells, you're not going to see anything. Um, you can also look at cells. That's what cytologic examination. You look at the infected host cells. I would say probably least common for diagnos diagnosis um, in a clinical setting is electron microscopy. I don't know how many clinics actually have an electron microscope. Probably not a ton but you can, in theory. Um, when we collect a specimen, we wanna collect a specimen early in infection because that's when the virus is actively replicating and you'll probably have pretty high numbers of the virus. Um, the type of collection, just like with bacterial infection or suspected bacterial infection, the type of collection depends on the area of the body that's been infected. And especially when we're talking about enveloped viruses, it's really important to get that sample to the lab before the virus degrades, particularly if you wanted to do culture. But even then, um, you know, if the virus falls apart, it's really difficult to do um, antigen interactions. If you're trying to do um, like reverse transcription PCR, you're trying to look for the RNA and the virus has degraded and the RNA has degraded, you have no option. Okay, so it's important to get the viral sample to the lab uh, before it degrades. So those of you who may end up looking at host samples, like host tissue samples, you could be looking for those cytopathologic effects like I told you about. So when you take a class um, like hematology, you'll look uh, at the blood. A really great class to take that um, I think they're offering in the spring is like a class like histology. So you learn to recognize what normal cells look like, like not just blood cells, but like other cells, what they look like. And you can see then what an abnormal cell looks like. Um, so you could look th for things like changes in morphology, formation of vacuoles, um, lysis of cells, the syncytia, those giant multinucleated cells, um, or inclusion bodies. 
And again, I am in no way, shape, or form an expert at looking at infected cells, but I know it can be done. You can do electron microscopy. There are some viruses that the patient will shed so much virus that you don't even have to concentrate it. So things like norovirus and rotavirus are GI viruses. There's so much that's shed in the feces, you can directly look at the feces under an electron microscope and see the viral particles. Um, other times you can do a modification that they call immune electron microscopy, where you can use antibodies to cause the virus to clump. So if it's at a lower concentration, or maybe it's in a different type of tissue or a different type of fluid, um, and then you can see the clumps under the electron microscope. So again, direct microscopy would be of something like rotavirus, where you have a, a high viral um, shedding. You can try uh, to propagate viruses. Uh, I think we might be going in order of <laughs> least to most acceptable ways to propagate a virus. You can't technically use people to propagate a virus, though people are great systems for propagating viruses. You can use animals. Um, in a lab setting, small things like mice or rats would be good. Uh, embryonated eggs, this is also how some vaccines have been generated. So like a fertilized egg. Organ culture um, or tissue culture. So tissue culture, you have to, if you're gonna do tissue culture, you have to think of a couple of different things. So one, tumor and immortalized, tumor or immortalized cells are easiest to grow um, because they're cancer. And cancer grows because cancer grows, right? It just grows. Challenge is cancer cells already look weird under the microscope. So how do you know if it looks weird because of the viral infection or it looks weird because it's cancer? So more likely you would want to use a primary cell culture, so one that's not immortalized. They're harder to work with, not impossible, but at least you would be more likely to say that this, the changes to the cells that you're seeing are because of the viral infection, not because the cell is already weird. So that's if you do need to culture the virus. So one, it's challenging um, because you are using cell culture. And two, a lot of viruses that we talk about are actually at biosafety levels where you wouldn't want to culture it because your lab is probably not certified to do that. Okay. Um, but you can also look for um, maybe not even changes in the cell shape, but death of cells. So a normal happy cell culture should look something like this. You see the cells are all right next to each other, right? They are, it's usually a contact dependent growth. Cells will stop replicating when they're touching, like, oh, we're out of space, okay. Uh, but they'll all be attached to the bottom of the plate. So that's why they kind of look a little bit elongated because they're attached. With viral infection, especially that's lytic or it causes cell death, you see all these gaps now where the cells aren't touching each other. You see that some of them look round and they're no longer attached. And then here with the arrows, they're trying to point out ones that are like those uh, multinucleated cells. They've kind of fused together. So you can look for those changes in cell culture. So some of the cytopathologic effects or the CPE that you might see would include cell rounding, degeneration, cells aggregating, not attaching to the dish. Um, you can see changes to the nucleus and cytoplasm because of uh, inclusion bodies. So DNA viruses, like as they're replicating all their nucleic acids and doing all their transcription in the nucleus, you can get inclusion bodies um, in the cytoplasm, of course, because that's where the virus is replicating and assembling. The syncytia, which are the giant um, multinucleated cells because the cells are fusing together, which is super weird. Um, and you can see sometimes changes to the cell surface depending on what your microscope is like. And that can be because viral antigens are being expressed on the host cell surface. Um, and sometimes you get agglutination 
because they're expressing proteins that cause, uh, that, like hemagglutinin, that cause them to clump up. Okay, so we'll pick up with quantification on Friday. We have just a few more slides here, and then we'll start talking about the papillomaviruses. That's our first group of viruses we're going to talk about. Um, so today in